بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والله أكبر والله أكبر على المتجبرين وعلى طغاة الأرض وعلى من آذرهم ليوم الدين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وما كنا لله منصفين ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We start in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, the owners and the master of the heavens and earth and the universe and all that has been created and all that will be created. Our anchor in existence is God, the one and only. The anchor that gives us certainty that there will be accountability and there will be justice. The anchor that stabilizes us in our existence that gives us an unwavering sense of direction and a commitment to what is truthful, what is good, and what is beautiful. Tabarak Allah jala fi samai wa buruja وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة خلفة لمن أراد أن يتذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما Praise be to God who has created the heavens and created the stars and all that is luminous and all that is good. The one who has created night and day and he has given us the blessing of a reminder and given us the blessing of certitude. Allah reminds us of the quintessential character of a Muslim. A Muslim treads on this earth with humility and certitude. The certitude does not make a Muslim arrogant or hubris or destructful or self-entitled or selfish, or self-centered. A Muslim, by definition, lives committed to the principle of justice, the principle of humility on earth. And humility, true humility, comes when you do not transgress upon the rights of others and you do not take anyone for granted and you do not deal with this world as if a race, a color, an ethnicity or indeed a religion is entitled to have power over all 
or to dominate or to have a hegemonic power over others. Ibad ar-Rahman, those who follow, those who submit to Rahman, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Of course, ar-Rahman is one of Allah's names. They tread upon this earth lightly. But let me very quickly say then that there is a difference between treading upon this earth lightly and turning away from the ignorant and the self-entitled and the hubris. There is a difference between that and apathy. A difference between treading on this earth with humility and not caring about justice or equity or fairness. Our belief in Allah, our Iman, our certitude that this universe has an owner and that ultimately this owner is sovereign and this owner decides what takes place on this earth does not translate into an apathetic attitude towards what is just and what is fair and what is beautiful. In fact, that same owner that placed us on this earth and commanded us to tread upon it with humility and forgiveness and with care and with sensitivity, that same owner commanded us to live a life of reflection and pursuit of justice as an essential principle for all human beings and especially Muslims. The verses that I recited are from Surah Al-Furqan towards the end of the Surah. And if we have time, I will comment further about the end of Surah Al-Furqan, but let's see how the time goes. But Jum'ah was decreed for Muslims so that we, for the remembrance of Allah, لِذِكْرِ for the remembrance of Allah, but not a theoretical abstract remembrance, but rather for Muslims to come together, reflect upon the affairs of their day in light of dhikrillah, in light of what our belief in Allah, what our belief in God would require of us and demand of us. So Jum'ah is a congregation not for self-involvement, not for a feel-good meeting. The reason that we get together in Jum'ah is not to, pray, to sing a few hymns or a few psalms and say, praise Jesus, and we all feel good for the moment and then return to our lives as if nothing has changed. That is a distinctively modern Christian practice. It's not even a pre-modern Christian practice. It's, it's something that evolved in the modern age. The idea of a congregation prayer so that we can all simply feel good and escape life in the day of rest. That's a modern Christian theological idea. Remember that Jum'ah in the Islamic tradition was not necessarily a day of rest. It became a day of rest after colonialism. The first to 
administratively decree that Juma would be a day of rest and not a day of work was in the colonial era. In the Islamic tradition, you cannot separate your belief in the one and only, in the master of this universe, in the sovereign of this universe, from the living affairs of your life. In the same way that you cannot suspend God in the way that you deal with your family, you cannot suspend God in the way that you deal with your society and with your community. And that is why we reflect upon and we do dhikr collectively by remembering Allah, but Juma was decreed so that Muslims can come together and highlight the most important issues that confront the Muslim community at the particular time in which they live. There are several issues that we need to address so that our Jumas do not become a form of self-indulgence and simple self-promotion, but in fact lives up to what is demanded of us, that we remember Allah as our law relates to our living existence and living issues. Prime among these issues that we have to address that we're simply compelled to address is the so-called peace plan proposed by Trump and company in the Middle East. And the reason that we have to address this and simply cannot marginalize it as an issue of foreign affairs that might or might not impact upon our lives is fundamentally because of Jerusalem, and more specifically, Masjid al-Aqsa, the Aqsa Mosque. And even more specifically, because there are Muslims in this country, in the United States, that have taken the bizarre position of working with the Trump administration or even supporting the Trump administration as if this is consistent with their Islamic with their Islamic ethics and morality. It is no secret that the Trump administration, after having moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, now ignores international law, ignores the numerous resolutions that were passed by the General Assembly or the Security Council over the years, ignores the Geneva Convention, ignores morality or even natural law, natural law, the rule of ethics. And what is the rule of ethics? The rule of ethics would simply state that you cannot usurp the homes of others, take their land, take their home, and eject them out and kick them out 
and they then say it is someone else's problem. Remember the long procession of concessions that Muslims have made in historical Palestine. From 48 and the partition of Palestine to 67 and the loss of the entire historical Palestine with occupied territory that has been time and again designated as occupied territory, time and again over the years, the international community condemns Israeli colonial settlements, the colonizing of the occupied territories in the West Bank, what the Israelis call Judea and Samaria, and the destruction of Palestinian homes. Eventually, Muslims accept the idea of a divided Jerusalem between West and East, with the idea that half of Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, would be the capital of the Palestinian state. And at a minimum, that Muslims would have access and control of the Aqsa Mosque without having to go through Israeli authorization and sovereignty. Well, the Trump peace deal, was, if de described as a peace deal, would give entire Jerusalem, including the Aqsa Mosque, to the Israelis. Would allow for the existence of truncated settlement spots in the West Bank for Palestinians under effective Israeli sovereignty. No Muslim would be able to visit the Aqsa Mosque without going through Israeli authorization first. And if you haven't had the experience, any Muslim, Trump says Israel is a democratic state and they've done a great job taking care of the Aqsa Mosque, hard watch. It's absolutely nonsense. This Israel that has done a great job taking care of the Aqsa Mosque does extensive excavation under the Aqsa Mosque that has destabilized the structural integrity of the Aqsa Mosque. This Israel that respects the Aqsa Mosque not a week passes without Israeli settlers invading the haram of the Aqsa Mosque and violating the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. If you're a Muslim and you want to visit the Aqsa Mosque, tons of Muslims will tell you what they go through when Israeli security forces them to strip naked and puts them through enormous humiliation and at the end either allow them to visit the Aqsa Mosque or not allow them as, as Israeli authorities see fit. Someone like me would not be allowed to come close to the Aqsa Mosque. There are a lot of things in this so-called peace plan, including the typical colonial attitude of, well, Israel first wanted for, for ages now. At one point thought the Palestinians, instead of being allowed, especially refugee Palestinians, the displaced Palestinians, instead of being allowed to return to their homes, Israel has had the attitude, well, it should be Lebanon's problem. It should be Jordan's problem. It should be Saudi Arabia's problem. 
Arabs should just give citizenship to Palestinians and solve the problem, we bring settlers from all around the world to colonize Palestinian territory, to take Palestinian lands and homes, any Jew from around the world that wants to come and settle in one of our s settlements, they would have a right to do so by law until very little remained of the West Bank. And what has remained are basic ghettoized, compartmentalized, territories, truncated territories, that if you look at the map of Palestinians in Israel, it very much looks like it very much very much looks like an apartheid picture. with Palestinians being constantly at the mercy of whatever the Israeli military authority wants to do and whatever Israeli settlers will allow them to do. But in this typical type of attitude, now instead of it being Lebanon's problem, Jordan's problem, Israeli thinking, has reached the point of saying, well, now it should be an Egyptian problem. We should cut out a part of Sina, a part of Egypt, and Palestinians should move there. And there is an Israeli propaganda film that they're showing these days in all the Israeli organizations that says a two-state solution is not possible a one-state solution is not possible because it would endanger Israeli democracy and to give all these Palestinians Israeli citizenship and it would endanger the Jewish identity of the state. So what is the solution in, again, if you go to any synagogue, you can, if you, you'll see that documentary that they're showing these days. The solution is to chop up a part of Egypt and that part is where the Palestinians will move from the West Bank. Again, another displacement. And this would become the Palestinian state. But it would become a Palestinian state without sovereignty because the Egyptian army and the Israeli army would run the military administration of this so-called Palestinian state that exists partly in Gaza and partly in Sina. Shockingly, this plan is in fact supported by the leaders of Arab states, but is not supported by the leaders of Arab states because they represent the sovereign will of their people. It is supported because they are corrupt and spineless and all they care about is to stay in power at any cost. As you saw when Trump was announcing his Israeli plan, the strangest peace settlement I've ever seen in my life, because he basically, this same exact plan was proposed by Netanyahu years ago, and it was taken literally verbatim, and now announced and proclaimed as a U.S. plan. So you sit with one side of the conflict, the Israeli side, you basically take the right-wing Israeli proposed settlement, and then you tell Palestinians and the rest of the Muslim world it's a fait accompli, and it's a done deal, forget about Jerusalem, you've got nothing to do with Jerusalem, it is ours. 
and we will allow you to come or not to come at our discretion. And forget about the West Bank. All you can dream of is Gaza and the usurpation of Egyptian territory and attaching it to Gaza so that it becomes a Palestinian state. But this Palestinian state can forget about sovereignty. If this is not the epitome of injustice and the epitome of what colonialism does, I don't know what is. Do you think that this has the potential of ever ending terrorism? When you displace human beings, you usurp their homes, destroy their dreams, confiscate property and territory, and move human beings like pieces of chess, chess pieces on a chessboard, all for the sake of Jewish identity and Israeli identity and Israeli self-determination. So on the one hand, you give full measure to Israeli self-determination. And you tell Palestinians and the rest of the Muslim world, Israeli self-determination should determine your self-determination. In other words, you determine yourself in reaction to and in accommodation to Israeli self-determination. Israel has the sovereign right to determine what it wants and what is in its best interest. And then your role is to accommodate and to accept and to adapt. And then you think that this will bring an end to terrorism? You think that this will actually create long-term peace? As an American Muslim, what concerns me the most is that you rob me of Jerusalem. You inflict a net another egregious injustice upon Palestinians. And then when I see the representatives of the Emirat and Bahrain and Oman standing there like puppets, useless, spineless puppets, as Netanyahu and Trump gloat about the colonial plan, and I remember that there are American Muslim leaders who are funded by the Emirat and continue to support the Emirat. It breaks my heart. And I have the right to have my heart broken. Any American Muslim that still hasn't seen the light about what Saudi Arabia and the Emirat and Israel are doing in the Muslim world, then shame on you. And I'm talking specifically about people like Hamza Yusuf, who has a lot of Muslim admirers. Shame on you. At the same time that Emirat appeared with Trump and Netanyahu in yet denying and stealing Palestinians, robbing Palestinian rights, at the same time, they had a new shipment, specifically 300 military vehicles that landed in Egypt to be supplied to Haftar forces in Libya. The same day, you can see what the Emirat is doing in Yemen, the continuous, non-ending slaughter. And you can see what the Emirat is doing in Libya, and you as a Muslim American continue to describe the Emiratis as the government of tolerance and the government of peace. Any American Muslim who has still not gotten the point, shame on you. You have nothing 
of what the ethics of Islam are. None of the Islamic ethics. Because you side with the powerful against the disempowered. You side with the arrogant against the, the, that who has no means for self-identity and self-determination. The most important thing in this day and age is to know what is right and what is wrong. People say, well, but what can we do about it? Well, let me tell you, if you are an American Muslim, what you support on the net, who you watch, who you give a thumbs up to, matters. Leave alone who you donate to, matters. If you've never voted, what is going on should teach you that your vote matters. If you've never been involved in politics, what Trump has done to Jerusalem should teach you that you should be involved in politics. This should light up a fire under Muslims in the U.S. and everywhere to know that their political activism matters and their voice matters. Do you think that Allah in the final day will going to say, well, you Muslims basically abandoned Jerusalem and the Aqsa Mosque, and that's fine with me, no problem? Allah is going to ask each one of us what you did, what did you do? What did you contribute? While Allah teaches us that we tread upon this earth with humility and humbleness, we do not arrogantly assume, take others for granted. We do not deny the rights of others. We do not look only at what privileges us and benefits us. That's what the Quran is talking about. But the law of humility, you cannot be truly humble unless you understand what your rights are first. There is a difference between treading upon the earth with humility and treading upon the earth as a broken human being. Allah doesn't tell us tread upon the earth as broken degraded, demeaned human beings. Allah says, tread upon the earth with humility and do not listen to the arrogant and the ignorant. Do not resort to injustice because the injustice of others doesn't justify your own injustice. But you are not capable of true humility unless you have a sense of your own identity and your own sense of justice first. At a minimum, as the Prophet ﷺ taught us, if you can change something with your hands, do it. If you can change something with your speech, do it. But if you cannot, the least you can do is to know what is right and what is wrong in your heart. And this is the weakest of all. At a minimum, you should know that Jerusalem, Muslims have a right in Jerusalem and have a right in the Aqsa Mosque and that displacing Palestinians is wrong. And that installing a dictator and a tyrant in Egypt so that he can give lands, so he can take lands from Egypt and grant it to the Palestinians and destroy the the habitat 
of Egyptians who live in Sina and Rafah and raise their homes and destroy their lands and their, and their agriculture and displace them to make space for Trump's plan is wrong. At a minimum, that should be clear in your heart. Because if it's not, then Islam has translated into nothing to you. If you do not at least know what injustice is, and at a minimum, your heart rebels against injustice, then Islam has translated into nothing for you. American Muslims, you cannot forget Jerusalem. Generations of Muslims over hundreds of years sacrificed everything so that the Aqsa Mosque the place where the Prophet ﷺ visited in Al Isra wal Mi'raj, the land of Ibrahim, the territory that unites, the, the, that represents the pure monotheism of Islam. Al Aqsa Mosque is the meeting point for the, all the Abrahamic prophets, ending with Muhammad. If you take Muhammad out of the equation, then you do not have an Aqsa Mosque anymore. But if you only consider Muhammad and not the other prophets, then the Aqsa Mosque becomes meaningless. I heard a Saudi on one of the YouTube channels saying, oh, the Aqsa Mosque doesn't matter to Islam. A, a, a mosque in Uganda is, is more important than the Aqsa Mosque. This is the type of ugliness and injustice that so many people want to in install and insert in the Muslim heart. But it is incumbent upon us whether we can change anything or not that we know what is right and what is wrong and to raise our children with a full knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. Israel does not have the right of sovereignty over the Aqsa Mosque. Israel does not have the right to move Palestinians as if they're chess pieces. Israel does not have the right to settle in Palestinian territories and simply kick them out whenever it's convenient to accommodate new Palestinian Israeli settlers. Israel does not have the right to install a dictator in Egypt so that they can rob Egyptians of their own sovereign will and their own territory and give it to Palestinians to solve a problem that Israel created. This is what creates terrorism. When Muslims feel like they have no sovereign will and an absolute no self sense of self-determination. This is the true reason for terrorism. But we must quickly remember that in the same Surah Al-Furqan, in which Allah teaches us to tread upon the earth with humility, Allah reminds us that to kill a human being in other than self-defense, in other words, to do what terrorists do, is the most grave injustice. So this in no way acts as an excuse for those who perpetuate terrorism. But in every way, in every way, underscores and underlines what is right and what is wrong, what is black and what is white, what is dark and what is light. <laughs> Bismillah.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد النبي الأمين وخاتم الأنبياء أجمعين Among the core morality that we must teach our children and raise our children to understand is that if you are a Muslim and you accept tyranny as legitimate wherever it may be, in whatever shape it may exist, then there is something wrong with your iman. There is only one sovereign, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no place for tyrants in an Islamic moral order. I'm not talking about Islamic polity, I'm talking about a moral order. In other words, whether it's a state calls itself Islamic or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is your moral awareness. There is no place for tyrants, not just in a state, but there is no place for tyrants in a community, in a family. Because Allah taught us that our affairs should always be run according to the principle of shura, consultation and consensus building. If you are a tyrant in your own family, then work on your iman. Ibad ar-Rahman, alladhina yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. The essential character of a Muslim is one that is not arrogant and not tyrannical. Among the things, the affairs of our world that unfolded these days, some people wrote asking me about, some even sent me a video of it, things that occurred at Azhar in Egypt. And basically, so if you've not been following the story, Egypt, the Azhar University in Egypt had a conference on renewing Islamic thought and in that conference the president of University of Cairo delivered a speech in which he said the the usual type of stuff we hear about Islamic reform uh, you can uh, interpret the Quran as a is, is good for all ages and times. You can interpret the Quran in many different ways to uh, accommodate the demands of your age. Uh, that the so not all the Sunnah yields normative binding commands. That there are hadith mutawatir, hadith that are of higher certitude and authenticity, and there are hadith ahad. There are sing, hadith of singular transmissions and that Muslims should not follow the weak hadith, and so on and so forth. And what happened is that the rector of Azhar, Ahmad al-Tayyib, responded to this talk by urging Muslims not to abandon their tradition and their heritage, and said things about feeling degraded and powerless as he watched Trump and Netanyahu talk about the their so-called peace plan. And some people asked, well, what do you think about what the Sheikh of Azhar said and what do you think about this whole incident and so on? The part that concerns me about this entire thing is this idea of renewing Islamic thought or renovating Islamic thinking. People. Tyranny, tyranny 
is immoral. Period. What is the problem with the entire discourse about renewing Islamic thought launched by Azhar? The problem is, is that this entire conference and this entire discourse is founded on a platform of tyranny. Why? Because it is President Sisi who wants Islamic thinking reformed. It is President Sisi who has been talking about reforming Islamic thinking since he came to power. It is President Sisi who ordered Azhar to have that conference. Islamic reform in a tyrannical framework works this way. You can talk about whether the companions of the Prophet were wrong or right. You can critically engage the companions of the Prophet. You can even critically engage the Prophet. You can even talk about whether the Quran is completely authentic or not authentic. You can't do one thing. You cannot critically engage Sisi, the president, or his government. There is no the entire discourse about Islamic reform by governmental command, by tyrannical command, is a farce. It's a farce. So what the president of Cairo University said is a farce. And I, the Sheikh Ahmad al Tayyib, the rector of Azhar, his response to what the president of Cairo University said is also a farce. Because it's all being unfolded on a platform of tyranny. It is not self propelled by a sense of self determination and free will. It is discourse mandated by those who have guns and prisons and torture human beings. So if you want to talk about Islamic reform, the most critical thing about Islamic thinking is to teach people that torture is always wrong, that imprisoning people unjustly is always immoral, that raping women in prisons and sexually assaulting men in prison is fundamentally immoral that for a tyrant to rule over human beings and not give them the freedom to determine anything about their own fate is fundamentally immoral and un-Islamic. So the most important thing to reform about Islamic thinking is for Muslims to understand that tyranny is shirk. It's an offense against Allah directly. But you can't talk about that in a conference about Islamic reform because if you do, you go to prison. So all this talk about hadith and interpreting the Quran and whether you can do marriage this way or do talaq that way or do inheritance laws, it's all a farce. It's meaningless. The most critical moral value that Allah taught us is that Allah is sovereign and you are free. You are free to believe or not believe. Can you compare? You don't have the right to force people to believe. So, how can you force me? To say ameen to a human being, whatever that human being decides. Until Muslims understand that tyranny is a shirk. All else are details. Tyranny, and again, in a family, in a marriage, in a community, in a village, in a country, is shirk. Islam came as a rebellion against the jahiliya, the ignorance of racism, ethnocentrism, bigotry, and tyranny. 
One final thing. Some of you might know about this. Something that sort of exploded all over the media and people wrote to me about and so on. There is a Quran that was translated to Hebrew by the King Fahad Foundation in Saudi And a Palestinian scholar reviewed that Quran and said that he found 300 mistakes and that that Quran legitimates the translation of that Quran to Hebrew legitimates Israeli points of view for instant calling, for instant calling the masjid in Jerusalem, the mosque in Jerusalem, calling it a temple, deleting the name of the Prophet Muhammad, etc., etc. Because a lot of people ask me about this, I did verify, I wasn't able to get a copy of that Quran in Hebrew, because I wanted to check it for myself. But I did see there was in the videos that were on the net, someone had taken a picture of a page of that of Surah Al-Isra, verse 7. And reading the Hebrew, I did verify that it said temple and instead of masjid, instead of mosque. However, I will tell people who've written me about this the following. We are reacting because we feel powerless and the humiliation of tyranny makes people extremely sensitive and extremely aggressive. This Quran was translated by a fellow called As'ad Nimr Basul, translated from Arabic to Hebrew. Incidentally, this is not the first time that the Quran was translated to Hebrew. There are three translations of the Quran to Hebrew done by Israeli scholars. These translations are not good. They, they misrepresent a lot of things. There is a fellow called Subhi Adawi from Jordan who translated the Quran to Hebrew in 2015, and that translation is actually good. But because it was sponsored by the Jordanian government, it get, didn't get a lot of distribution. Asad Nimr Basul, who translated this King Fahad edition of the mosque, is actually a respectable scholar. He's a Palestinian scholar who lives here in the United States, lives in Chicago. I don't know him personally, but I, I know his work. And Asad Nimr Basul actually translated the Quran to English and published the, his translation in English, you can find it on Amazon, before translating the Quran to Hebrew. And in that English translation, because I've checked, he does, instead of saying Masjid al-Aqsa, he says the temple. So he does call the Masjid al-Aqsa temple. I'm not sure why he does that. I'm not sure what his thinking was. But what I do know is that after the breaking out of the story, the King Fat Foundation withdrew the PDF of the translation of the Quran to Hebrew. This type of paranoia about an extreme distrust of what governments do and what they're up to speaks, tells you a great deal about our affairs as Muslims. Because we feel powerless, because we feel dispossessed, we suspect, we live in a, suspicion, a state of suspicion and anxiety. We do not live in a state of repose and humility. True humility comes from a deep sense of empowerment and balance. 
the more you are disempowered, the more you see conspiracies all around you. And the more you see, you look at people with great suspicion. And distrust. The Prophet ﷺ, and I will close with this, taught us that till the final day there will be always a fi'ah in ummati, a, a group of the ummah, a, a, a distinct group of the ummah, a small group of the ummah, that will persevere and hold on to the truth and will not care which direction the world goes. If you notice the Quran itself, when it always talks about the majority of human beings, it always refers to the majority as not doing the right thing. أَكْثَرِ النَّاسِ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ أَكْثَرِ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ Most people, the majority, will always swerve. That should encourage you, as it encourages me, to hold on to the basic principles that a man gifts us with. The principle of Ibadatullah I owe my allegiance to the sovereign, but I do not surrender my will to any other human being. My will is surrender to Allah, but no human being can own or possess or control my will. As a Muslim, I live vigilantly believing in the principle of justice as my salvation and as my Shafia, um, what's Shafia? As my method, as my interceder, what will intercede on my behalf when I meet my Lord, when I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will say, Allah, yes, I know that you've created me in a difficult time. I know that so much in the world went this way and that way, but my vision was always clear. I believed in you as I believed in your justice. And I believed in you as I believed in your beauty. I believed in the possibility of beauty and the possibility of justice because I believed in you. And that is how I want to meet my Lord. It's all Allah yastajib lakum. Inni da'i fa'aminu. Allahumma ghfir lana. Allahumma arhamna. Allahumma ya Rabbi hidina ya kareem. Li akraba min haza rashada. اللهم وفق المسلمين وانصر الإسلام يا علي يا عظيم الله grant us your forgiveness your, your, your compassion and your mercy الله grant us guidance and knowledge and certitude and make us among those who tread upon the earth with humility and confidence and repose يا علي يا عظيم وأقم الصلاة